Hello, let's go over the Chinese culture and art. And this is pretty much going to be for before 1300 CE, that era um, lecture. So we've got the terracotta soldiers here. We'll be talking about them in a minute, but I just think that they're an amazing artifact, an amazing feat of hundreds of thousands of artisans making these amazing objects. And this is some music if you want to listen to uh, things I found that might be the music that would have been made during this time period. All right, so we're going to start with the Neolithic cultures of China. And so you can kind of see here, these would have been the different cultures um, during the Neolithic period, which is kind of between 10,000 BCE to around 2000 BCE, and those are speculative dates. And then the size of present day China, so you can see how much it's grown in, you know, whatever, about 4,000 years. So the Neolithic cultures, um, during that time period, it was pretty chilly. So the typical degrees would have been around 50 degrees. And you can start to see um, some of the settlements that they would have lived in, the communities that they started to develop, um, the hunting and gathering that would have been happening during this time frame. And that, again, they grew up mostly around the two main rivers at the time. And that this was um, definitely, um, in this part of the world, there was a lot of customs, um, different types of architecture and ways of utilizing the materials that were available to them. And a lot of um, pretty intelligent choices being made um, that don't always necessarily get referenced as much as a lot of the European history does. So like I was saying, there were most of the communities were around the Yellow River and a little around the Yangtze River, which makes perfect sense because the river is going to give um, water for being able to start to sustain a civilization and grow crops and such. This is an example of what they think. This is a recreation of um, a Chinese structure from the Neolithic time period. These are some of the artifacts. Um, this is a bowl from around 3200 to 2600. BCE and also a plaque, a plaque, excuse me, from a the same Neolithic period. And so you can already start to see uh, the craftsmanship of these artifacts. Um, the painting that's going on inside and outside of the ball. Clearly there's some specific, specific type of brush and paint being applied to this pretty highly well-structured bowl with a lip. It's very round. So you kind of start to wonder what, what type of tools have they already developed during this time period. Um, this is one of the earlier um, bowls that was found in uh, Banpo, and, which is near uh, Xi'an which is actually near where the terracotta soldiers have been found. And this is a great video that if you'd like to watch it, I encourage you to, to learn more about the Neolithic time period in China. Um, but there's a lot of evidence that there was definitely um, cultures, towns, cities being developed, which means, and you can kind of almost see a narrative in this bowl with the fish and something that looks a little bit like a human, um, so, you know, the representation of a human and an animal, maybe there's even masks, so that might un display either a ritualistic ceremony that could have been happening, or um, just again, like the artisans that were potentially creating things to either worship ancestors or worship gods so they could continue to sustain themselves by getting their harvest and obviously being able to fish and, you know, um, acquire enough sustenance for the community. So one of the things that I wanted to point out is kind of doing a comparison of an artifact from China. So this is the bowl I was just discussing 
to a bowl that we talked about um, earlier in the semester made in Greece. So this would have reflected the Greek culture. And of course, the time frame isn't exactly the same, but up around the same time frame. And you can already see um, some differences between what types of tools that these different civilizations would have had. And I think it's interesting to reflect on that and just think about the evidence that we have of European culture is, um, uh, well, there's been more research and discovery uh, throughout Europe than, than in China. And so it'll be interesting as China develops more of its understanding of the history and uncovers some of the mausoleums and different things in the future to be able to give more context to its history. Here's another example comparing um, a jug from the Minoan period and a jug from um, the Chinese period, also both, you know, Neolithic and similar time frames, um, about a thousand years off. But what's interesting is just the pattern and then the unique shape. And so I'm just trying to show you um, the skills and the techniques. I'm not trying to say that one is better than the other. Obviously, it's just there's some similarities and yet there's a lot of unique qualities as well. So moving on with the, um, this is sort of like the last Neolithic uh, period where um, off the Yangtze River, and this period is, we're starting to see um, the collection of tombs and burial sites. And so that's acknowledging that there um, might have been a division of class and you can find in the tombs a lot of jade artwork. And just also this also might indicate um, they're beginning to have some sort of a relationship to death, uh, some sort of a funerary um, structure. And so it's interesting to think about that in relationship to the other cultures that we've studied. These are some of the really sophisticated jade work that also references the potential skills of the artisans and then the tools that would be required to make these very precise incisions um, in the jade. And you can also, again, start to see some sort of representation like of a, of a face and maybe some sort of a mask covering. So that might also, <clears throat> excuse me, indicate some sort of a ancestral worship or, <coughs> excuse me, something to do with some sort of um, nat supernatural beings. Potentially a higher power. And again, kind of comparing um, just similar dates, um, very different material, but it's acknowledging um, what's most important to think about is just the tools and the resources that are available. And that kind of relationship that I discussed before, the cognitive, how the hand is working with the brain and the skills of the artisans who are making these different artifacts. So the Bronze Age, there's kind of three main dynasties that I'll introduce you to. Uh, the Qi dynasty, the Chai, Kai, I'm just going to destroy these words. I'm so sorry. Um, the first dynasty, uh, indicated, and here's an artifact from that dynasty that they think is um, some sort of a bowl type structure. And so during the first dynasty, it was pretty clear that they were already coming up with um, different ways to not control, but deal with flooding. Um, well, of course, control the flooding, but um, deal with the civilizations that were starting to accumulate a a certain amount of population. And obviously the leaders would have to deal with how to control the people that were becoming more, more and more people that were populating these communities. And unfortunately there was no written history. So a lot of these stories are from oral traditions and so it's hard to know exactly um, what the leaders were doing and what kind of technology 
was being made to help with the flooding that was happening in certain areas because the Yangshi and the um, would sometimes like over, you know, flood. Sorry. The Shang Dynasty, um, that was where there's a lot of um, archaeological evidence to really show that there would have been some sort of palace or ritual site uh, that we start to see um, weapons of war. Um, so you would have seen swords and objects that would have used been used in in war 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 war, war, war uh -huh. that would have been used um, in combat basically and, and or would have been used for um, killing animals. But there was definitely weapons that were found in the burials and also. Um, more indications of some types of offering to uh, some sort of a higher spirit. And that could have been um, honoring your ancient relatives or some sort of like God or pow higher power. And so here um, you'll find in a lot of the Shang Dynasty, these uh, Fang Ding ceremonial cooking ves vessels. Also during this time, there was something called the bone oracles and this is a great video that goes into detail about that and so it was believed that um, there were you know nature and fertility spirits that were being honored and that oftentimes the Shang priests would communicate with the natural world using these animal bone um, oracles and so they would inscribe a question and, and this also um, indicates that we're starting to um, see the earliest forms of Chinese writing, and you can kind of see how it's similar to pictographs, um, in, but yet also more advanced. Um, and so they would have the question heated up and it would crack and that would, then that would be interpreted as the answer to um, the priest, the oracle's vision, and that would then be communicated to the emperors or the ruling um, folks in that particular community. The Shao Dynasty, um, they were conquered the Shang Dynasty. And during this period, it was really a high point for um, bronze work. And so the artisans who had learned how to control and manipulate bronze and make it into different vessels, artifacts, weapons, had really achieved um, quite a bit of skill in their techniques. So uh, firing them, having different types of kilns, different types of um, tools that would enable you to make these really beautiful markings was at a, a high point. And also during this time, um, Confucius, Confucianism really grew and became um, part of the belief system and was very much become either a lot of great philosophers during this time exploring different ways of considering how people should um, relate to one another and relate to the political system that would have been happening. And so there's definitely evidence that um, there were schools and um, different ways that people would learn from these scholars. And also um, during this time period, it was clear that there was some sort of connection to um, the spirituality and that came oftentimes through music. And you can see that during this time period that one of the um, Zhao dynasty nobility who would have been considered like a duke um, in his mausoleum in his tomb, out of the 15,000 objects, they found this really elaborate set of bells. And so you can, you can imagine that it just shows that in this particular um, small, semi-small community and this short-lived province in southern, in eastern Zhao, um, that the, there was a lot of culture and reflection and intention to create music which might have communicated to a higher spirit.
And if you want to listen to a contemporary version of this um, reenactment of this instrument, I found a link. So moving on to um, one of the really important dynasties is the Qing dynasty. And that was when the first emperor of China um, brought all of these different smaller dynasties and ruling kingdoms under, under one rule. And this is the territory during that particular time. And this is the ruler who had a huge impact on, I mean, he named, he was the person who gave China its name. He unified um, all of the different warring states um, into one uh, large territory. He was known as a very harsh and repress repressive ruler, but he was also someone who brought the people together through a lot of military combat. Um, but he also was known as a very um, intense, complicated man um, who was a very good um, military warrior. And he's responsible for not the Great Wall had started before um, smaller sections of it, but kind of combining it and turning it into what we know as the Great Wall. And he's also famous for the terracotta soldiers. So this is a digital illustration of what his tomb would have looked like um, potentially when it was being built and, you know, maybe for a hundred or so years until it was, um, you know, kind of taken back by the land. But um, it's interesting as you, there's a lot of information for you to, if you want to learn more about the first emperor of China, Emperor um, Chao Chin, Emperor Chen, um, if you want to do more research. What's interesting is, and one of the things that I'll try and introduce you to, is they, they still haven't actually uncovered his actual tomb. I think they're uncovering sites that are around his tomb, and, and there's evidence in that, and there's lots of um, information about that. But they haven't actually uncovered his tomb, or what they think might be his personal domain tomb. So through lots of bloody va battles, um, he unified the seven, war the seven war warring states and uh, brought together and unified China. So one of the things that they have uncovered is the terracotta soldiers. And they're really not sure exactly how many there are because they haven't even uncovered all of the tombs that are all of the, the area, I guess like the underground complex, so to speak, um, that Emperor Chin cr created um, in his lifetime. And um, they think, I think they've uncovered close to 10,000 if you, you know, whatever the most current documentary about his life is, but they just keep uncovering more evidence about who this leader was and sort of his obsession with the afterlife. Um, there's a lot of, some people think that, um, you know, he brought in a foreign artists who helped craft these artists, these artisans, these uh, warriors. But again, like there's, um, it, history is always be, being rewritten. And so there's certain suggestions and there would have been some sort of trade and influence from outside uh, China that could have potentially helped with the crafting of these warriors. Um, this is a great video if you wanna learn more about the terracotta warriors. So here's a digital drawing of what could be inside his personal chamber and what they think it might be is sort of like a, a map of the Qin Dynasty territory during the time of his rule and some sort of a mercury lake. So during his um, dynasty, he really did um, have extraordinary political, military, and economic power. I mean, he must have had tremendous economic power. And so there was a lot of advancement in social, cultural, and artistic um, skills and conversations and political um, advancements during his empire. 
but he was obsessed with the afterlife and it's it's supposedly thought that he was obsessed with the afterlife because he killed a lot of people to get to his to be able to be the emperor and so something kind of snapped in his mind at one point and he thought that if he died all these people that he killed would definitely torture him so he wanted to be immortal so he worked with all these kind of um alchemists and they came up with a magical potion that he drank which had some sort of cinnabar which is a type of mercury which of course ended up killing him so even though he was incredibly brilliant in one regard he was also very obsessive and a little crazy at the same time so um supposedly uh he started building his mausoleum as soon as he um, came to the throne at the age of 13 and you know over probably more than seven thousand seven hundred thousand workers built all these different pieces or areas of this complex that you know is still slowly being um, uncovered and so it's hard to know but what's interesting is um, I was lucky enough to go to the uh, terracotta soldiers, this, these vast um, spaces. You can see it's sort of like a, I mean, this, it's a couple of football fields. It's huge. And it's in this sort of um, dome-like space. So they're protected. And each soldier is a different face and a um, little bit of a different influence, which might indicate the different ethnicities of the provinces in China at the time, people coming from Mongolia, Tibet, India, and then choosing to be live in China, it's hard to say. But each individual out of these, you know, 10,000 soldiers that they've uncovered so far is a totally different face, different body, different muscle structure. It's unbelievably impressive. So you can kind of, this is sort of what it looks like now um, in the sense that they haven't uncovered it um, for lots of different reasons. They're, uh, they're nervous about having enough modern technology to uncover it without destroying it. As they uncovered um, the terracotta soldiers, I guess when they first opened these parts of the, the complex, his um, tomb structure, um, they were painted, and then as soon as the air and oxidization happened, the painting would kind of fade away. So they're trying to figure out ways to excavate these sites um, without destroying them. There's a really interesting video on Prime, if you have Amazon Prime, um, called The First Emperor, The Man Who Made China, if you wanted to learn more about it. So not only did he, um, you know, have this massive tomb built, he also is responsible for extending and connecting and making the, the, the Great Wall of China, which is one of the longest walls in the world. And it supposedly, you know, not only he built it, but, you know, um, it's been approximately it was built over about 20 years and lots and lots of um, people who built the wall died. Um, supposedly over a million slaves built the Great Wall. And it's also an impressive feat and a, a very um, massive, um, it, you can't really see it here, but it's a massive, massive structure. So the, the, the phenomenal um, legacy that emperor, this emperor left is in, incredibly impressive. So moving on to the Hung Dynasty, which came after the um, Qing Dynasty. And the Hung Dynasty is really responsible for managing and um, making more public the Silk Road. So I think the Silk Road was happening during the Qing Dynasty, but then during the Hung Dynasty, it became more of a trade route. Um, also during this time, there was a lot of peace, prosperity, and stability. So for a good chunk of time, um, poetry, literature, philosophy really flourished. Um, Confucianism and Taoism were more at the forefront of 
Chinese philosophy um, and beliefs, uh, the Silk Road linked China uh, all the way to Rome. And so there was a tremendous amount of trade and uh, sort of international influence coming into China and China also then influencing these other parts of the um, developed world at this time. And this is when Buddhist art starts to show up and um, Buddhist influences start to um, spread slowly um, because of the Silk Road. So the Silk Road was an incredibly important international trade route for most of um, the um, commerce that happened between around 130 BCE and then you know, the 14, 1500s. It was about a 2000, it was a, you know, a thousands of mile route that enabled ideas, culture, inventions, and unique products to spread across much of the settled world. So the settled world thus far. And um, it was kind of like, you know, uh, one of the first highways, so to speak, of this ancient, tr this ancient trade route. During this time period, there were many, many goods, ideas, diseases, all sorts of things that were transmitted and uh, passed around uh, from this trade route. The Ottoman Empire boycotted the trade route at around 1453 CE, um, mostly due to the tremendous amount of money that China was making, and then also um, the diseases that were starting to become a huge problem. So you can do some research and learn a little bit more about that. So here's some of the goods that were traded and you can kind of see what was coming from what country and how vast uh, the, because we are, we're talking about at this point, not only the trade route from the Silk Road, but then also the maritime, the trade that was happening via the the waters and the oceans and the um, inland routes as well. One of the things that I want you to think about with this learning unit is the, the contemporary, the modern version of the Silk Road called the Belt and Road Initiative. And so I'm going to introduce you to a couple of um, videos that you'll watch to reflect on sort of the historical influence that the Silk Road had on the developed and settled um, civilizations at that time, and then what this modern Belt and Road Initiative and the influence it would have on future generations and your own current life. So here's a couple of videos and there's a bunch more, but you can just see um, what's already existing, what's under construction, railroads, pipelines, gas lines, different ports. Um, and it's massive. And so um, I'm hoping that you will take the time to learn about this and be aware of this massive international trade route that's being developed that um, isn't talked about as much in the news as I wish it was. So also during the Hung Dynasty, um, Taoism and Confucianism were, were pretty much like the typical um, cultural philosophy. And to me, one of the biggest differences was that Confucianism was very rational and it really emphasized um, duty and self-discipline. And from my understanding, it kind of taught like the idea that there was this ancestral um, respect and that the way that you dealt with your elders and that process of thinking and living kind of transferred into the political life as well. And so it was this connection between this, this hierarchy of respect. And then Taoism, from my understanding, I'm, I'm not a, um, a serious researcher in either of these philosophies, just read a little bit to understand. Taoism is a little bit more based on individualism and a relationship to nature, a little bit more abstract, and the emphasis is on the spirituality towards nature. During the Hung Dynasty, um, 
there's all different types of architecture being built. And here's a reconstruction. This is a digital drawing of one of the palaces. Um, most of the buildings were destroyed because a lot of them were built with, with local products, which would have been a lot of wood. So over time, they were either just destroyed because wood doesn't necessarily last forever and also fire. But there's a lot of um, ceramic models that were have been found that give indication of the achievements that these architects would have created during this time. And so you can kind of see almost um, apartment-like structures that would have been built up in the different city structures that would have been happening during the Hung Dynasty. And then after the Hung Dynasty, there were these, again, there was um, the fall of the Hung Dynasty splintered China again into these different warring kingdoms. And so during this time, it was more turbulent. Um, and even though it was, the art still flourished and people, um, the invention of the woodblock started to happen during this time period, poetry, painting, um, were becoming more of a, a personal modes of expression. Um, even uh, calligraphers, which in the past calligraphy had been, you know, this very um, sought after profession was becoming a little bit more picturesque and taking on a personal signature. Um, so there was a lot of changes happening during this sort of separation where these different kingdoms were taking on their own personality, so to speak. Also during this time, the Silk Road uh, was becoming more and more of a trade route and Buddhism had each reached uh, China from India and it was becoming more of a philosophy that was being practiced and the many people were identifying with the teachings of the Buddha. And um, you can see here, this is an example of, this is a 45 foot statue that would have been carved out of a cave that you would have seen if you were on the Silk Road. And I think it's absolutely stunning. And, and to think that it's, you know, from 460 CE, still in fairly good condition, obviously maintained, but it shows what people would have seen um, in a similar way. It's maybe like an old, like a very ancient style of a billboard as you're on this route, you would see this, you might stop there, start to learn about this belief system. The paintings during um, the six dynasties were um, also a time where people were starting to have a, a different, moving away from um, some of the more political structured styles into something a little bit more personal. And so here, the, um, you see a painting that's a political parody um, and a story that was written by the poet Shang Hao. And it's interesting to think about that this is a story about the imperial family and um, the instructions that are being taught to the court ladies. And here's a detail of that painting. So like I was saying, um, calligraphy was an incredibly important art um, and it was supposed to reflect the moral concerns of the person who wrote the calligraphy and it was regarded as one of the highest forms of artist expression. This is the work by Wang Jiai and it's an example of a letter that he was writing. So the Su and the Tang dynasty, you can start to see um, their territories are growing um, and you can kind of see how China is really um, expanding. During these dynasties, um, a, a, the artwork was becoming a lot more elaborate. A lot of the tools that the artisans had access to at this point enabled them to have a lot of detail in the fine qualities of the drapery, of the fabrics, the indications of all the details, um, 
in the repetition of the patterns. It really indicated a lot of development during this period. And there was just a strong sort of realistic um, gesturing in the artist's techniques and crafts. Here's a great video that talks about the Tang Dynasty um, from its beginning into its fall. So the Buddhist art and architecture um, during this time, you can start to see the construction of the, the way that the roofs are built and um, the modular style that's happening with the functionality of these, the architecture. Also during this time, you start to see more of the pagodas that are being built and how um, the pagodas were kind of a, a different type of architectural structure that would have potentially housed a lot of um, relics of the Buddha. The different types of um, paintings and the scroll paintings that would have been created. This was painted on silk. And during this time period, a lot of the silk that was exported to all over um, the settled world would have been made by women. And so a lot, you can see here that that's being reflected in the painting. So during the Tang period, the Silk Road brought a lot of foreigners into different main cities in China, and that influenced the type of artwork that was being made and the techniques that were also being explored in the ceramics, in the painting, um, and then also just in um, the, the stylistic of the representation of people. Woodblock printing was invented around this time, which really enabled um, the Buddhist religious texts to be distributed um, to a, a, a wide variety of people and it enabled them to print these books that were very inexpensive so the belief system could be distributed amongst a, a large percentage of the population. Coming to the Song Dynasty, um, which was really influenced um, by now all of these different cultures that were coming in and having an influence on the artisan style, um, the representation of the different types of belief systems, the representation of how the art is being depicted, being influenced by different artisans that would have come and there would have been all of these different relationships that have been created along this trade route. So different styles are being explored. It was a, it's really interesting to think about the amount of people that would have crossed, pa cro crossed paths at this time period. And here you can see um, the different, uh, the, the, how large the Song Dynasty was. The paintings during this time period, um, you can see that there's a realistic but yet abstract quality to how they're observing nature. Um, you can kind of see a foreground, middle ground, and then a background further back in the distance. Um, and it was supposed to, this painting style really reflected um, not like a specific place, but it was supposed to be more the concept of nature and its connection to human emotion. And so these landscape paintings were like a little bit idealized or romanticized of depending upon the artist ideas that they were trying to communicate. This is one of my favorite ones. I just enjoy how it's um, abstract, but yet you can still sort of see the definitions of the mountain and then the simplicity of the water. And remember, these would have been rolled out. They wouldn't have been on display. You would have looked at these a little bit at a time, which is also really interesting to think about. 
However, some of the artists did depict things from a more um, realistic perspective, showing all of the observations of the people during this festival. During this dynasty as well, because of all of the different influences from artisans coming from this massive trade route, you see these this beautiful ceramic vessel being made using again like a style that was interpreted by probably artisans sharing um, different traits and, and, and skills in the ceramic field. So you see this beautiful white glaze and these spontaneous cracks and just the elegance of this object. So the last dynasty that we're going to talk about is the Yang Dynasty, which was actually um, the Mongols uh, from Mongolia came and was controlled by the leader Khan, Kublai Khan. This is a great video that talks about this wonderful, huge um, painting that was made during the Yuan Dynasty. So the Yuan Dynasty was huge and um, it's really interesting to think about how much power it had and it was established for, you know, a couple hundred years. Um, or no, sorry, I lied. I'm horrible at math. It wasn't a couple hundred years, but it sustained itself for a time period. And then unfortunately, um, during its time period, there was, um, so basically the Mongols were a big, they were protectors of the Silk Road. They would, um, they really helped grow the Silk Road and their military might was massive. They were very, very good fighters. And so it was very easy for them to take over from the Song Empire. During the um, Yuan Dynasty, sorry, I got the dates. I said the dates wrong. It wasn't a couple hundred years. Um, during the dynasty, they were the ones that created paper currency, which became incredibly important um, amongst all of the settled territory at the time. And um, they were also really, really favorable for continuing to trade with all the different settlements at the time. So it was almost 100 years. It was about 89 years that the Yuan Dynasty ruled. And during this time, because it was conquered by foreigners, um, there, was a, there was a lot of... Um, There, be, there became a lot of unique artwork made during this time, and a lot of interesting things happened during the foreign rule with different ideas um, during the occupation. So here's just some examples of some of the artwork that was made. Um, this is this, that huge painting that you just looked at that's about 24 feet high and about 50 feet wide. And it shows the healing practices of the Buddha. And you can see the bodhisattvas that are sitting around the Buddha. And um, it's just, I think it's a really stunning art piece of artwork. Here's another piece that shows the Tibetan Buddhism influence at this particular time. And um, this is a silk tapestry. So how things were being painted in this textile process. And then finally, um, of course, tons of artwork had been made. I was just giving you a sprinkle of some of the examples. Um, the Ming Dynasty took over after the Mongol rule, the Mongolians rule. And um, basically what happened was the Mongolians, there was famine and plagues and floods and a lot of natural disasters and then a lot of infighting amongst each other, which enabled the Ming Dynasty to take over. So I'm going to end it there. Here's a bunch of helpful links that I hope um, if you want to learn any more, these are all documentaries that you can research. So it's a lot of information. I hope you made it through and thank you for listening.